uh, the National Institute in Johannesburg, my dear comrades and friends. Well, I think we've uh, reached the conclusion of this remarkable gathering of uh, masters, other intellectuals from various corners of the world, and the working people in the city. And I'm, uh, I share the optimism of Mary when she says we are on the way to the march towards, uh, mm -hmm. towards socialism or consolidating Marxism. And I think this could be no better venue for, for observing Marx 200 than the city of London, which is where he was produced the most productive of his works. And I think this is the most befitting uh, conclusion that you are having on this session, Marxism is a force for change today. And I've just added one word to it in my paper, which is a written paper, which I'm sure will be available to you, the organizers will do it. And my, I'm really grateful to the Marx Memorial Library and to all others who cooperated with it for organizing this event. And we're very happy to be associated with it and coming all the way from India to participate in it. But let me uh, begin in a nutshell, not reading the paper, but trying to just make some of the basic points because of the shortage of time that Mary had said. That why do I say that Marxism is the most potent force for change today? We've heard so many quotations from uh, all through the day, but one quotation of Lenin, I think, sums up the whole issue, which really describes why Marxism is the most potent force. And that is when he answered the question saying, why is it? that hundreds of thousands of people are attracted to Marxism world over. And what is that, that unique quality in Marxism? He describes, he answers it by saying that that quality is that it is the only philosophy that combines the revolutionary, emancipatory aspiration of man, of humankind, along with being supremely scientific. These qualities of being supremely scientific and revolutionary this is what is Marxism's essential attraction. And precisely because of these two qualities, it is the most potent force. And why I would say that is how we have internalized Marxism in India. We believe and we understand that Marxism is unique in the sense that it can be transcended only when its agenda is realized. The agenda of realizing a classless communist social order. Specifically under capitalism, its understanding of capitalism is alone thorough enough for it to comprehend the historical possibilities that lie beyond it. Hence, Marxism can never be under capitalism rendered superfluous until capital, capitalism itself is superseded. Post-capitalism, Marxist philosophy and worldview continue to be the basis for the creation of a classless society. This implicitly means that Marxism is not a dogma, but a creative science. What we've heard this morning, concrete analysis of concrete conditions, and we continuously enrich our theory with our praxis and our praxis on the basis of theory. It is a most potent force because Marxism is not only a materialist interpretation of history. Marxism is not only the materialist basis for a social transformation. Marxism is essentially the answer to the battle of ideas of humanity. And in this answer to the battle of your ideas for humanity, it is a continuous theoretical enrichment. And therefore, it's never a closed system. And then the creative science, it is the only, only philosophy that today allows us to understand as we are all preparing ourselves to be taken over by artificial intelligence before this decade ends, uh, what this means, to understand how, how technology itself and science and technology become a productive force by themselves, how ideas, as Mary just uh, reminded all of us, with a little paraphrasing, not of the masses, but idea grips the minds of the people, it becomes a material force. I mean, this is what makes it the most potent force, but it has to be based on a scientific understanding and analysis of what, what is the present world that we want to change. Now, we've been through the, all the sessions this morning, so I do not want to repeat much of it, and much, and much of it is there in the written text, which I'm sure you'll uh, have access to. But the essential features today, today's world is what? 
that you have a process of imperialist globalization that is on, which is characterized by three basic important features. There are many others, but three basic important features. One is the gigantic accumulation of capital, reaching levels unprecedented in human history. Second is that this accumulation of capital is being led and propelled by the leadership of global capitalism today, which is the international finance capital. There's a transition from the Leninist conjecture of you having different imperialist centers coming into conflict with each other with their finance capital, with the coalescence of industrial and banking capital. But today, this is transcended to assume an international character, which leads to the, led to the third possible, I mean, the development, that is a greater cohesion in the world global imperialist camp. Instead of inter-imperialist rivalries, the remarkable feature of this period is greater cohesion in the imperialist camp that in order to exploit the rest of the world and intensify exploitation and maximize capital, imperialism acts under the leadership of international finance capital. It's no longer individual imperialist centers financial capital competing with each other. This is the order that led to this imperialist globalization. Now, after these 10 years of uh, the a systemic crisis of capitalism. After the financial meltdown of 2008, this order is collapsing. The ideological framework for this order is, was, is neoliberalism. This order is collapsing in the sense today, what we, what we find is that the neoliberal order is unable to deliver what it had promised of greater prosperity to the people and growing protests against this the various phases of this crisis and currently the entire protests that are seen all across the world against greater miseries being imposed by this neoliberal order. These protests themselves are creating a political situation whereby in order to control these protests there is a rightward political shift that is taking place globally. We discussed that in detail in the earlier session so I'm not uh, repeating much of it and this rightward political shift essentially is a to divert the attention away from a left progressive alternative to neoliberalism by disrupting the unity of the working people led by the working class in order to provide this alternative that is one objective at uh, the national institute in johannesburg many comrades and friends well, I think we've uh, reached the conclusion of this remarkable gathering of uh, masters, other intellectuals from various corners of the world and the working people in the city. And I'm, uh, I share the optimism of Mary when she says we are on the way to the march towards, uh, towards socialism or consolidating Marxism. And I think this could be no better venue for, for observing Marx 200 than the city of London, which is where he was produce the most productive of his works and I think this is the most befitting uh, conclusion that you are having on this session. Marxism is a force for change today and I just added one word to it in my paper which is a written paper which I am sure will be available to you, the organizers will do it and my, I am really grateful to the Marx Memorial Library and to all others who cooperated with it for organizing this event and we are very happy to be associated with it and coming all the way from India to participate in it. But let me uh, begin in a nutshell, not reading the paper, but trying to just make some of the basic points because of the shortage of time that Mary had said. That why do I say that Marxism is the most potent force for change today? We've heard so many quotations from uh, all through the day, but one quotation of Lenin, I think, sums up the whole issue, which really describes why Marxism is the most potent force. And that is when he answered the question saying, why is it? that hundreds of thousands of people are attracted to Marxism world over. And what is that, that unique quality in Marxism? He describes, he answers it by saying that that quality is that is the only philosophy that combines the revolutionary, emancipatory aspiration of man, of humankind, along with being supremely scientific. These qualities of being supremely scientific and revolutionary 
This is what is Marxism's essential attraction. And precisely because of these two qualities, it is the most potent force. And why I would say that is how we have internalized Marxism in India. We believe and we understand that Marxism is unique in the sense that it can be transcended only when its agenda is realized. The agenda of realizing a classless communist social order. Specifically under capitalism, its understanding of capitalism is alone thorough enough for it to comprehend the historical possibilities that lie beyond it. Hence, Marxism can never be under capitalism rendered superfluous until capital, capitalism itself is superseded. Post capitalism, Marxist philosophy and worldview continue to be the basis for the creation of a classless society. This implicitly means that Marxism is not a dogma but a creative science. What we've heard this morning, concrete analysis of concrete conditions, and we continuously enrich our theory with our practice and our practice on the basis of theory. It is a most potent force because Marxism is not only a materialist interpretation of history. Marxism is not only the materialist basis for a social transformation. Marxism is essentially the answer to the battle of ideas of humanity. And in this answer to the battle of your ideas for humanity, it is a continuous theoretical enrichment. And therefore, it's never a closed system. And then the creative science, it is the only, only philosophy that today allows us to understand as we are all preparing ourselves to be taken over by artificial intelligence before this decade ends, <laughs> that what this means, to understand how, how technology itself and science and technology become a productive force by themselves, how ideas, as Mary just uh, reminded all of us, with a little para paraphrasing, not of the masses, but idea grips the minds of the people, it becomes a material force. I mean, this is what makes it the most potent force, but it has to be based on a scientific understanding and analysis of what, what is the present world that we want to change. Now, we have been through the, all the sessions this morning, so I do not want to repeat much of it, and much, and much of it is there in the written text, which I'm sure you'll uh, have access to. But the essential features today, today's world is what? That you have a process of imperialist globalization that is on, which is characterized by three basic important features. There are many others, but three basic important features. One is the gigantic accumulation of capital, reaching levels unprecedented in human history. Second is that this accumulation of capital is being led and propelled by the leadership of global capitalism today, which is the international finance capital. There's a transition from the Leninist conjecture of you having different imperialist centers coming into conflict with each other with their finance capital, with the coalescence of industrial and baggage capital. But today, this is transcended to assume an international character, which leads to the led to the third possible, I mean, the development, that is a greater cohesion in the world global imperialist camp, instead of inter-imperialist rivalries, the remarkable feature of this period is greater cohesion in the imperialist camp that in order to exploit the rest of the world and intensify exploitation and maximize capital, imperialism acts under the leadership of international finance capital. It's no longer individual imperialist centers financial capital competing with each other. This is the order that led to this imperialist globalization. Now, after these 10 years of uh, the uh, systemic crisis of capitalism, after the financial meltdown of 2008, this order is collapsing. The ideological framework for this order is, was, is neoliberalism. This order is collapsing in the sense today, what we, what we find is that the neoliberal order is unable to deliver what it had promised of greater prosperity to the people and growing protests against this. 
the various phases of this crisis and currently the entire protests that are seen all across the world against greater miseries being imposed by this neoliberal order. These protests themselves are creating a political situation whereby in order to control these protests, there is a rightward political shift that is taking place globally. We discussed that in detail in the earlier session, so I'm not uh, repeating much of it. And this rightward political shift essentially is a to divert the attention away from a left progressive alternative to neoliberalism by disrupting the unity of the working people led by the working class in order to provide this alternative. That is one objective. The other objective is to disrupt this through attacks on democratic rights and the rights to collective bargaining and to the rights to, to uh, revolutionary actions. And this, this is accompanied by a process whereby you weaken the working class itself, where increasingly you have contractualization, the temporization of the working class, casual labor and working class in my country, India, I can tell you. It's only 6% of the country's labor, I mean working class, which is today what we call organized working class, who have the trade union rights. 94% do not. Now this is how this modern day capitalism is operating, that is, seek to destroy the unity and the revolutionary potential of the working class and the working people through such attacks, and that is the meaning of this rightward shift. It will have various expressions, neo-fascistic, xenophobic, racist, and also religious fundamentalist in the part of the world that I come from, and of both the varieties in our neighbors, if it's a Hindu religious fundamentalism on one hand in India, it will be an Islamic fundamentalism in the other two neighbors of, Africa, I mean, of India. So all these elements are brought into a political rightward shift, that is a political challenge. The other thing that is happening is that this crisis itself is creating the, the cohesion of the imperialist camp that we spoke of earlier, that is freeing down. With Donald Trump as an expression of this right word shift coming in, I mean, people are talking about the Trump world. I mean, I don't think even Donald Trump knows what is the world that he's creating <laughs> or what sort of prejudices that he's moving into. But whatever we say, but it's full of uncertainty. Well, he's going to be the North Korean leader, I'm told now. So that's uh, that's anyway, that, that's a different side. But uh, but in this, the cohesion of this imperialist scrap is breaking up. Brexit is one example. The Trans-Pacific uh, Agreement that he walked out of is another example. So you have increasing conflicts among the imperialist centers that that are here. Now, in this situation. This process of imperialist globalization, which essentially relied on forcible expropriation of, of surplus, not through the process of national accumulation of capital, but not through the appropriation in the national process, but forcible expropriation. That is going back to the methods of primitive I mean, uh, primitive accumulation which is the characteristic, as far as we, from the developing world are concerned, of this imperialist globalization that has been happening. Now, in response to this, the growth of these movements that are revolutionary movements that are growing today will have to confront and combat these challenges. And how does one do that? I believe Marxism alone gives us that, uh, uh, that capacity to actually galvanize what Lenin had called the subjective factor. And that subjective factor is under the leadership of a revolutionary party with the coalition with all other left and progressive parties to build the strength of the working peoples in struggles under the leadership of the working class to actually implement or realize what Marx had called the point is to change this world. And that subjective factor standing is what is essentially the task, I believe, of all us, of us communists in each one of our countries. The objective situation of growing discontent, intensifying exploitation, that is today existing in the world. But the subjective factor's consolidation is today being assaulted by this political rightward shift, 
It's being assaulted by direct imperialist interventions. It has been assaulted by military interventions in various parts of the world and assaulted most the, uh, mostly in those places where the revolutionary movement is on the ascendancy, like Latin America. And it is this onslaught that has to be met, and that can, can only happen if this subjective factor is strengthened, number one. Number two, the crisis is now clearly demonstrating that there is no, it's a systemic crisis and there is no solution to the capitalist crisis within the boundaries of capitalism. The solution only lies in replacing or overthrowing capitalism. Whatever be the intensity of the crisis, Marx had taught us, capitalism never collapses automatically. Capitalism needs to be overthrown. And that overthrowing can only be done in individual countries by the basis of strengthening this subjective factor. And this strengthening of the subjective factor, I think, is the essence of the change we are talking of in today's world. And why I say that in this process, many of us will go through many intermediary stages. Many of us will go through that once the moment you address the actual living issues of the people, you find responses today coming in also to challenge this rightward shift. Whether it's Jeremy Corbyn in the UK or Bernie Sanders in the USA, you have the have the responses that that are there among the working people to a people's agenda. Central to centers to strengthening the subjective factor is to bring back people's agenda, but people's issues as central to the agenda. And our ability to do that is what will actually allow us to strengthen the subjective factor and move towards the change. But why do I say Marxism alone is the most potent, most potent uh, weapon for that? Because it is the only philosophy, only ideology, only program of action that provides the ideological foundations and the theoretical underpinning for strengthening the subjective factor. And therefore, if you want to change this world for the better, there's so much more I would like to discuss, but then all it is to uh, adhering to Mary's uh, direction of saying shortage of time, we have to begin the call by 5.30. So therefore, I would li like to only stop here to say that this is the potent force primarily because it is praxis. Praxis is a combination of theory and practice without giving precedence to any one of the either. Learn from both. And it is that process, this praxis, this revolutionary praxis, is what my Marxism is all about. And that is why I think Marx 200 and this uh, remarkable event here should <coughs> inspire all of us from various parts of the world that were gathered here to say, Marx 200, the time has come to change this world. Thank you. <laughs> At uh, the National Institute from Johannesburg, many comrades and friends. Well, I think we've uh, reached the conclusion of this remarkable gathering of uh, Marxists, other intellectuals from various corners of the world, and the working people in the city. And I'm, uh, I share the optimism of Mary when she says we are on the way to the march towards, uh, mm -hmm. towards socialism or consolidating Marxism. And I think there could be no better venue for, for observing Marx 200 than the city of London, which is where he was produce the most productive of his works and I think this is the most befitting uh, conclusion that you are having on this session. Marxism is a force for change today and I just added one word to it in my paper which is a written paper which I am sure will be available to you, the organizers will do it and my, I am really grateful to the Marx Memorial Library and to all others who cooperated with it for organizing this event. And we are very happy to be associated with it and coming all the way from India to participate in it. But let me uh, begin in a nutshell, not reading the paper, but trying to just make some of the basic points because of the shortage of time that Mary had said. That why do I say that Marxism is the most potent force for change today? We've heard so many quotations from uh, all through the day, but one quotation of Lenin, I think sums up the whole issue which really describes why Marxism is the most potent force. 
And that is when he answers the question saying, why is it that hundreds of thousands of people are attracted to Marxism the world over? And what is that, that unique quality in Marxism? He describes the answer it by saying that that quality is that it is the only philosophy that combines the revolutionary, emancipatory aspiration of man of humankind along with being supremely scientific. This quality of being supremely scientific and revolutionary, this is what is Marxism's essential attraction. And precisely because of these two qualities, it is the most potent force. And why I would say that is how we have internalized Marxism in India. We believe and we understand that Marxism is unique in the sense that it can be transcended only when its agenda is realized. The agenda of realizing a classless communist social order. Specifically under capitalism, its understanding of capitalism is alone thorough enough for it to comprehend the historical possibilities that lie beyond it. Hence, Marxism can never be, under capitalism, rendered superfluous until capital, capitalism itself is superseded. Post-capitalism, Marxist philosophy and worldview continue to be the basis for the creation of a classless society. This implicitly means that Marxism is not a dogma but a creative science. What we've heard this morning, concrete analysis of concrete conditions, and we continuously enrich our theory with our practice and our practice on the basis of theory. It is a most potent force because Marxism is not only a materialist interpretation of history. Marxism is not only the materialist basis for a social transformation. Marxism is essentially the answer to the battle of ideas of humanity. And in this answer to the battle of your ideas for humanity, it is a continuous theoretical enrichment and therefore it's never a closed system. And their solution to the capitalist crisis within the boundaries of capitalism. The solution only lies in replacing or overthrowing capitalism. Whatever be the intensity of the crisis, Marx had taught us, capitalism never collapses automatically. Capitalism needs to be overthrown, and that overthrowing can only be done in individual countries by the basis of strengthening this subjective factor. And this strengthening of the subjective factor, I think, is the essence of the change we are talking of in today's world. And why I say that in this process, many of us will go through many intermediary stages, Many of us will go through that once the moment you address the actual living issues of the people, you find responses today coming in also to challenge this rightward shift. Whether it's Jeremy Corbyn in the UK or Bernie Sanders in the USA, you have the, have the responses that, that are there among the working people to a people's agenda. Central to strengthening the subjective factor is to bring back people's agenda, but people's issues as central to the agenda. And our ability to do that is what will actually allow us to strengthen the subjective factor and move towards the change. But why do I say Marxism alone is the most potent, most potent uh, weapon for that? Because it is the only philosophy, only ideology, only program of action that provides the ideological foundations and the theoretical underpinning for strengthening the subjective factor. And therefore, if you want to change this world for the better, there's so much more I would like to discuss, but then the point is to adhering to Mary's uh, direction of saying shortage of time, we have to vacate the world by 5.30. So therefore, I would li like to only stop here to say that this is the potent force primarily because it is praxis. Praxis is a combination of theory and practice without giving precedence to any one of the either. Learn from both and it is that process, this praxis, this revolutionary praxis is what Marxism is all about and that is why I think Marx 200 and this uh, remarkable event here 
should, inspire all of us from various parts of the world that were gathered here to say, Marx 200, the time has come to change this world. Thank you. Thank you.